So I'll start from the beginning. At age eight, I was performing on the front porch of my parents' house in the Thousand Islands where I grew up and I was born and raised. And um, by age 10, I was stepped onto my first public stage and I was performing up to 40 shows a summer. So 10 years old, 40 shows a summer, a lot of stress right off the hop. Um, in the beginning, performance for me was this freedom, it was this connection, it was this liberation, it was where I felt like I belonged. And then uh, high school happened, and bad skin happened, and bad grades, and I had sexual harassment and threats, and I also began performing solo for the first time. So that's much different than when you're up here with a group of people, and the kind of the energy and the concentration is spread over a, a cast. I was performing solo for the first time. So stage fright started to happen. This, this triggered the beginning of my stage fright, and a really, really negative lifestyle habit cycle. Um, so what began to happen is, and, and P.S., let me just like preface this for a sec. People ask me all the time, they're like, isn't just a little bit of stage fright normal? And yes it is, when it feels like butterflies or excited, nervous energy, probably what I have right now, um, that's, that's really healthy sort of stress or, or anxiety. But when it becomes, as one of my clients likes to say, tiny vampire bats with machine guns, like inside your stomach, that's not healthy anymore. And unfortunately, I didn't know the difference, and there's several reasons as to why. So what used to happen is I would show up, about 24 hours to 48 hours before a performance, I would just stop eating. I had so much anxiety and so much stress inside my body that I just couldn't eat food. I could barely like swallow my own spit type thing. And that turned into an eating disorder. It was at first I couldn't eat because I was struggling with anxiety, and then that became a way to manage my anxiety was bulimia. Um, so that was kind of the first thing that used to happen. And then I'd get to the venue, it started to, to be that I would get to the venue, then I did a show, and I would find a bathroom stall, which is like, it seems kind of unsanitary, but for me it was like this safe haven place where I could just have a meltdown. So I'd completely melt down, and I would um, bawl my eyes out, and just, it would be like the only time and place that I could relieve all this pressure before I went on stage. And in those moments, I felt really, really broken and alone. I, I didn't think that anybody understood, and I didn't think that anybody would understand. So I kept it to myself. And because I've been, been performing for so many years, this is about 14, because high school, I, uh, I was ingrained with this belief that the show must go on. So the show did go on. I'd get out of the stall, and I'd dry my eyes, and I'd reapply my makeup, and I'd walk out on stage. And the blessing and the curse to this piece is that I would always like absolutely slay. Somehow, some way, I was never publicly embarrassed. I would always crush it on stage. So the audience would applaud, my anguish would be put on pause. Um, but the curse was that I always did really well, so I never had any motive to change this like stressful cycle that was going on in my life. Um, so this went on for like, to, be, to believe it or not, this went on for like 10 years, 10, 15 years and nobody knew, not my parents, not my coaches, not my cast members, like, I actually tried to tell someone once, even just that I had a, a bulimia, that I had an eating disorder, and they laughed at me. They were like, you? Like, that's impossible, you, you, like, I don't believe you, basically. And so that was kind of the last time I decided to tell anybody that I was struggling, for sure. Um, I think there's a few reasons as to why this happened, uh, it's probably a laundry list, but. The three, one, the three reasons that I'm, I'm kind of sort of realizing right now is that 15 years ago, like there's a stigma today around mental health, obviously. Imagine what it was like 15 years ago. So there was no support and no education, more importantly, on what it was to struggle with the, with the mental illness and, and anxiety disorder, which is what I had. Um, so no support, no education. Um, that's the first thing that sucks. The second thing was that I didn't have any access to help. Like, we didn't even have Facebook back then, or YouTube. Like, this was dial-up internet. Does anybody know about it? <laughs> right? Like, the, so, I mean, to think that I could access a coach like myself, who now I coach others in managing their stage fright and performance anxiety, that just wasn't a thing. So I didn't have access to coaches, even if I knew that I had an anxiety disorder in the first place. The third most, and this probably maybe the most problematic, was that the general attitude in uh, my performance industry at the time was basically like, if you're too afraid to get on stage and do your job, then get off. Someone else will do it. And here's where the like hurtful part comes in, is that 
in those days, I did not know how to love myself without performing. Like performing was my everything. It was where I felt powerful. It was where I could escape the troubles of my life. It was, like I said, where I felt connected and where I belonged. And so I didn't know how to live without performance. I, um, it just wasn't an option for like my fear or whatever to be the thing that stopped me from performing because I couldn't survive without it. So for me, I was like, okay, well, I don't have fear. And I buried it. You'll bury yourself if you try to bury your fear. And just side note, humans have fear. You'll always have fear. It's not something to be afraid of. It's something to learn about so that you can manage your fear and then go back out and do your job. That's what I needed. I needed someone to tell me that. But I didn't have that. So I kept going. And I kept, I kept the, the um, cycle going. I, I was struggled with bulimia for about 10 years before I realized, like, oh, I have bulimia, actually. Um, I struggled with anxiety for about 15 years before I finally was able to get a grip on it. Um, and there was two pinnacle moments in my life that led to this outcome, this, this help that I got. The first pinnacle moment was that I lost my voice for a year. I was in a Grammy Award winning record deal at the time. And um, my stress and my anxiety and my like, quite frankly, shitty lifestyle because I had a lot of coping mechanisms caught up with me. And in those, in those moments, my, my voice just decided to like give out. And I had to give up my teaching career because I've been a wellness coach for the last 11 years and um, performer for the last 20 years. So I had to give up singing and speaking and teaching and all the things that I thought my identity was attached to. So you can kind of imagine how that rocked my boat a little bit. So that was, that was the first pinnacle moment. So what I did was, I'm like, well, let's just fix my voice. So I go to vocal therapy for two and a half years and my voice gets better and I get stronger because of that. And I still don't actually get to the source of my fear and my anxiety disorder. So then the second thing happened. And this second thing might not seem like a big deal to you, but to me it was kind of probably the worst thing ever. I was in a relationship um, with someone who I really loved. And because I didn't have all of myself, I was, I was broken in half. I didn't have all of myself. I didn't understand how to love my darkness and love my fear and my flaws. I brought half of myself to the relationship and I hurt them really badly. And the hurt that it caused me to hurt them was the, the final straw of me going like, whoa, I can't live like this anymore. This is, this, I just can't live like this anymore. This is too much, this is not healthy. And in that time of the relationship, Blue Matter comes into the picture. Linda launches the Blue Matter Project, the first ever Blue Matter training for people that wanted to learn how to teach yoga for mental health. And I took that training and the education that it provided and the, the awareness that it provided and the tools that it taught me made me realize like, oh, I have an anxiety disorder. Like, I need help right now. So Blue Matter was, this is why it's so important to me, Blue Matter was my connection to actually then not just go and get vocal therapy, but go into psychotherapy for three and a half years and really work out my past trauma. So that was the beginning of how I started to come out the other side. That's kind of like probably as much as I'll tell you in terms of the, the, my story, because there's a lot going on with my story. Um, but now I'm gonna tell you how I was resilient because the three year um, sessions with my therapist, it was like two hours a week, sometimes twice a week. Um, that was a real, real tough one. Like I struggled in my life before I knew I had anxiety, but then when I got into therapy, it was kind of like one of those things that maybe it gets worse before it gets better. But there's, there's a way to build resilience within that process. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna share that with you. The first thing that I'll say is that it's a multi-pronged approach. There's no one answer, there's no one formula that fits all. It's, it's a lot of different methods and it's, it, it's ever changing. So you have to test it out, you have to see what works for you. Um, as I already said, one of, my, one of the things that kept me resilient was my therapist. Um, the second thing that kept me resilient was learning, first of all, building awareness. I mean, that was step one, but building resilience. Uh, one of, the first, one of the major things was learning how to feel. So the only thing worse than having an anxiety, how many people, did you care if I ask you how many people have had an anxiety attack? Will anybody raise their hand? Yeah, okay, cool, so a few. <laughs> Welcome to the club. 
The only thing worse, in my opinion, than having an anxiety attack itself is having to hide that you're having an anxiety attack. Like being in public and just being like, how do I act normal? Now, I got really good at that because I dealt with it for like 15 years, but that's why my stuff started to come out sideways and, and my life started to fall apart because it was like, no, you can't live like this. You can't hide it anymore. You have to deal with this. So to, to allow yourself to be present with your emotions and to just feel them is one of the most empowering things you can do because it enables you to then go to the next step, which is to change. With feeling, though, comes tears. Sometimes all that's under an anxiety attack is a bunch of emotion, right? just sometimes. And so with, <laughs> with feeling, I then started to allow myself to cry. Let me just like preface this by saying, I don't care what your dad said, what your mom said, what your brother said, what your teacher said, what your coach said. Crying is not weak. It's one of the most empowering things that you can do and the one of the strongest things you can do. I get it that it's uncomfortable. Like, I'm from two German descent parents, <laughs> so we'll start there. I was a Sean Rio, black belt karate kickboxer and a, and a competitive gymnast before I was 19. Like I know what it means to pull yourself up by your bootstraps, you know what I mean? Um, but to bottle up this feeling, to avoid feeling it, is like not the answer. As a matter of fact, pain is the worst when we're resisting it. The rest is just tears. So you think pain is the worst when you're crying, but that's actually releasing it and, and processing it. Right, so, so feeling and crying, two really important steps to being resilient through your process. Um, the next one was uh, leaning on support. As William Ju said, your support system, your connections in your life is really, really, really important. That is, I think one of the reasons that our society is breaking down is because we're so disconnected. We're trying to be more connected on our, by, by looking into different people's lives on our phones, but all we're doing is missing the connection in the actual world around us. So, I mean, like, I hands down believe that community is, it's probably one of my most important goals this year is to build more of a community within the city of Toronto, which is really hard, because Toronto is like a nomad land, you know? Um, the other ways that I built resilience was to empower myself. There's a certain amount of things that you have in your control that you can do for yourself to empower yourself. Sometimes you don't have things in your control and sometimes you do. What I had control over was like, I could take myself to yoga. I was an instructor, but I could take myself to yoga and go to a yoga class. That was empowering. No, you can't yoga your demons away, but yes, you can do good for your nervous system by going to yoga. Um, meditation, journaling, breathing exercises, mindfulness exercises. No, those things don't necessarily take you out of an anxiety attack, but they do, they can talk you off a ledge. And imagine where my life would be without those things. Like if I struggled that long for 15 years, imagine where I'd be if I didn't have them, right? So it's just about trying to incorporate these things that, that talk you off a ledge and kind of take you from one place to the next, from A to B. Um, the next thing was forgiveness. I had to forgive my past and the mistakes that I made and how I hurt people and, and I had to forgive the people that hurt me. That forgiveness led to acceptance. When you can forgive your past and when you can forgive the ways that you feel like you are a wrong person or bad, then you can start to accept yourself for all parts of who you are. We are not whole without our flaws, without our feels, uh, fears, without our darkness, without our failures. We're not whole without any of those things. So, and as a whole, we deserve love. So once we can just kind of go, all right, that's a part of me, and I'm gonna choose to love that, then we will be whole and we will feel a lot more confident in life rather than breaking these pieces off and stuffing them down and pretending they're not there and pretending to be perfect. <coughs> it's not gonna get you connection and it's not gonna make you feel like you're strong. Um, courage, it takes courage to do all of that stuff. And courage is, it's one of my, you know, in the Performance Mindset Program, which is my online course to help people overcome stage fright. Courage is like the fun, the foundation. And courage is not something that you're born with. It's not something that's in your genes. It's a choice that you can make every single day, sometimes every single second. And sometimes you will be called 
to be courageous every single second. And then that'll die down and maybe you only have to be courageous every hour and then every day and then every month. But I implore you to choose courage over comfort. That is definitely the path to a meaningful life. And it's definitely the path to healing. So having said all that, um, I made it. <laughs> you guys made it. The world needs you. You have a message to share. Just being alive makes you valuable. It makes you worthy. There were days that I didn't think I was going to make it. There were days I didn't even want to make it. I lost my passion and my purpose. But if you do the thing, if you if you take this these multi-pronged approaches, if you apply all these different types of methods and, and keep going and just choose courage, you will make it out the other side if you're struggling. You will. You just will. That is the destination. That is the destiny. Um, so I just want to end this by a few things, two things here. One is a quote by uh, Susan David, who's a psychologist. I just heard this the other day and I thought it was awesome. Um, the the like, title is de hashtag dead people goals. So people are constantly trying to avoid feelings of discomfort and that's dead people goals. She says, only dead people never get unwanted or inconvenienced by their feelings. They never get broken hearts. They never get stressed out. They never experience disappointment that comes with failure. Tough emotions is living, is life. Discomfort is the price of a meaningful life. And that's basically what I just said. Courage is the price of a meaningful life. And it's the path to a meaningful life. Lastly, three, five of my fundamental core values. I'm just going to spit them at you right now. And then uh, we can proceed with the night. First one. You'll never be more fearless than when you face your fears. We're trying to be fearless all the time, guys. It doesn't make sense. We have fear because we're human, and we're human, which is, makes us have fear. So the best way to be fearless is to face your fears, is to acknowledge your fears, accept that your fears are there, and then to just implement adjustment modalities that create less fear in your life, okay? Next one, badassery is predicated on your bravery. Like, being an, a star athlete or a star performer or an excellent A++++ student is awesome and that takes hard work and there's a lot of skill and, and, and dedication that goes into that and there's nothing to diminish that. But what makes a badass is someone who's brave. And someone who's brave is someone who owns that they are a whole person with flaws and fears and all. Third one, in my opinion, the purpose of life is to serve others. It's not really about you at the end of the day. I believe that we go through this journey and that I went through my journey and struggled so that I could stand up here and share some knowledge with you guys that might help you. It might not, but at least there's that option. You can take it or leave it, right? It's the same with you. Your struggles are just a way to make you stronger and braver so that you can lead others into, into help and serve them in whatever way that they need or, can, or are asking for. Um, leads me to my next point, nothing is personal. Literally nothing is personal. It doesn't matter what people are saying about you. And to be honest, what people say about you behind your back is like none of your business and just not your problem. So nothing is personal, even when it does come at you, even if people are jealous, if people are trying to take you down or bullying you, it's just not personal. It is not about you. It says more about them than it does you. Lastly, if you can learn to be happy with nothing, you will have everything. I'm just going to let you think about that one. Thank you very much for having me.